everybody. This is Bonnie Vandermulen, Training Coordinator for Wisconsin Facets. On behalf of the entire Wisconsin Facets staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Today our webinar is entitled CPI Training and Overview for Parents. Our presenter for today's workshop is Judith Schubert. Judith has worked at the Crisis Prevention Institute since 1994 and has served as president of the Institute for 14 years. Judith has worked with schools at various stages of structuring approaches for training staff in nonviolent crisis intervention and has dedicated her career to learning about what works and what challenges in preventing critical incidents at school. Judith worked on a task force to develop best practices guidelines for the Child Welfare League of America and has written and presented on issues related to crisis prevention. Judith has a Bachelor's of Science in Sociology and Criminal Justice and a Master's in Leadership Development with a concentration on organizational learning. It is my pleasure today to introduce to you Judith Schubert. Judith? Thanks, Bonnie. Hello everyone and thank you for your interest in this webinar uh, and the importance of staff training in schools to manage uh, challenging situations and keep our children safe. Uh, CPI training, uh, CPI as you know is the Crisis Prevention Institute. Sometimes people hear of CPI training and it's used somewhat generically in some circumstances. So what I hope to do in our hour is enlighten you about what CPI training is to the Crisis Prevention Institute and our program called Nonviolent Crisis Intervention. Uh, the Nonviolent Crisis Intervention training is taught to school staff. It's a comprehensive program. If people have been trained in it, they will have these types of materials at the school. Again, Sometimes people just say CPI training and they may be referring to generally crisis prevention type training, but I want to make sure you understand that our program is called Nonviolent Crisis Intervention and as an institute, we not only manage the delivery of that training program through, we have uh, staff trainers, uh, they're called Global Professional Instructors, or GPIs, and they train, uh, they, tr they train delegates from schools, selected by the schools, to be certified instructors. So they are certified instructors within those schools that train other staff using these materials. The other part of the Institute uh, objectives is to monitor the delivery of that training through training quality standards that direct how to train the program, what uh, to customize in the program given, circum given circumstances within the schools, and then also they document that training with us. So we are aware that the training is being facilitated by an active certified instructor who has maintained standards, and that includes retraining and renewal of their certification. So I wanted to make sure I gave you that context that the CPI is the Crisis Prevention Institute. The program we train is called Nonviolent Crisis Intervention. It is a 14-hour curriculum uh, for the foundational training that we allow certified instructors to train in addition to other um, programs, advanced content, and other resources such as our advanced autism spectrum disorder program, trauma-informed care training, uh, some advanced training courses. Now, once they're certified as instructors, they come back for additional training, which allows them to further customize the train nonviolent crisis intervention program given those other kinds of issues. So, I'm going to talk to you today about the primary program, Nonviolent Crisis Intervention. And while it is a 14-hour curriculum, certified instructors have options to teach the components of that uh, within our quality standards. So if they're teaching the entire program for staff at the school, uh, that group of staff is going through training over one or two days. And we have an hour, so I'm going to be uh, not talking fast, but highlighting some areas that are taught in the program. Um, it's important that you understand that we are training this program in schools because we know that staff working in schools have many responsibilities. 
And, you know, educators attend university. Uh, they learn many elements of teaching and learning strategies and specializations uh, that they may study for their role in schools. Uh, and while there are courses related to behavior and classroom management, uh, we believe that there's a need for continual study in this area with, for professionals working in schools every day. Because as you know, as parents, a, a child can demonstrate certain behavior or respond in certain ways to circumstances one day, and their um, responses might be different the next day. And there isn't an exact script that we ha can possibly have to respond to those um, circumstances. So uh, what we do is we bring school staff together to organize their thinking about different circumstances which um, they might encounter. And we give them frameworks to view these and make good decisions uh, about their approaches. Our program philosophy underpins everything we teach, and that is about the values of care and welfare, um, how are we providing for the, the best possible care and considering the well-being of those children while maintaining our responsibilities for uh, safety and security? Uh, what we're very aware of through our training and through our work with schools is sometimes these things get out of balance. And I'm sure you can relate to that as parents. I mean, we that happens with us when we want to provide for the care for our children, but we also have some concerns about safety and risk factors. And sometimes we overemphasize because of our concerns about these safety issues. And, you know, you hear about the horrific incidents in schools. We're concerned about our children's safety in schools. Uh, because of things, you know, you, we were all reading about it in the paper, um, critical incidents. And a lot of these things become exacerbated because of sort of a viral nature uh, through social media. Um, weapons are brought into school, people get hurt, but that's at one end, that's extreme. And, and, and it fuels our fears and it can fuel the fears of school staff as well. And you start to move towards things like zero tolerance policies that may not be real realistic or uh, may not be understood that they're interpreted based on individuals and um, we're still considering the individual children. So um, all of these serious incidents that sadly we hear about um, do influence organizational safety uh, and they also influence organizational attitudes when we become afraid because fear can be uh, crippling and it can um, influence our decisions. So what we try to uh, do in the program is keep these things balanced. So every decision and every approach that staff use, they're coming from um, is this in the best interest of the care and welfare of the student that I'm looking at right now, that I'm responding to right now? And am I um, taking care of my responsibilities for the safety and security of emotionally as well as physically of all of the students that I work with? Um, so you might see these posters, uh, care, welfare, safety, and security in schools that use our program because it is a very important um, philosophy and we start the program by talking about these values and we attach the values of um, individual teachers and people working in schools to these values. What are your work values and how do they relate to uh, care, welfare, safety and security in your school environment? These are all of the different chaotic kinds of uh, things that are going on um, and are on the minds of participants that walk in the door of our training program. Um, these are complex situations. These are There's a lot of different things that they may encounter and they're thinking about these things. They're saying, I'm being sent, I'm going to a crisis intervention program. I'm going to a program about managing um, circumstances and behaviors. And it's very complex because all of these kinds of things uh, might be on someone's mind. So our aim is to put this into frameworks that help them organize that chaos. The goals of our program, our instructional goals 
first start to organize people's thinking about all of those different kinds of things that they encounter. Um, that is the reason we have models in our program that I'm going to go through a couple of, of those with you. Uh, we also establish a language for the nonviolent crisis intervention program because we all refer to things in different ways. So, you know, I can say, oh, that, that student is, is going off or that student is, you know, uh, tripping. <laughs> People can say different things, but we want a professional language. We want to be able to be efficient in our communication and know that I may see a child early in the morning and they're, they're just sort of acting a little bit different. I need to communicate that to someone else in the school that may see that child later so they can monitor and be supportive in the best way. So we establish a language, which I'm going to uh, go through with you a little bit here in a minute. Um, our aim is then to increase confidence in the staff that go through the program and have some reflective observations and have the opportunity to, to experiment and practice some skills so they're better problem solvers. We don't have scripts for every situation. Uh, what we want to do is help organize people's thinking, help them to consider the best responses, give them some skills, let them practice those skills so we encode sort of key learning into their, their memories and they take that back to their work with kids in school um, and provide for that best possible care, welfare, safety, and security. Um, so that's kind of the background. I just want to check with you, Bonnie. Am I talking too fast? Have people asked questions already, or should I proceed? No, go ahead and proceed. We have no questions at this time, and I think it's going according to plan. OK, thank you. All right, so as I mentioned, um, that organizing thinking is very important in the program. So we take that chaos, all those different things that people might be thinking about or concerned about, and uh, an initial model in our program that's built upon those four words of care and welfare, safety, and security is, is the crisis development model. And we take that model and we start to say there are actually four levels that we can organize your thinking into and your experiences in. Um, teachers are adults. Adult learning is very different than um, learning of children. As adults, we have experiences and we need new learning. Anything we learn that's new, we need that to connect with the experiences that we've had or that we're having for that new learning to matter. So we want to take all of those kinds of uh, circumstances that people encounter at, and apply it to this model. So we start with this crisis development model, and this is um, a, a rather lengthy component of the program, but I'm going to give you the highlights of it. And we, we look at four levels of behavior, and we talk about the first one. Again, this isn't a Webster dictionary. We're, we've created a dictionary really for the nonviolent crisis intervention approaches. So we, we refer to that first level instead of level one. We refer to it as anxiety, and a very brief definition is a change in behavior. So uh, when we see uh, a student that normally is very um, uh, calm, uh, they're suddenly pacing around, they're, they're interacting with people they don't normally interact with, that would be a change in behavior. We also might have a student that normally is rambunctious, normally is someone that is taking me a while to get them to settle down in class and, and take a seat. Um, and on a particular day, he is um, sitting in a seat, not, not taking me very long to get him calm at all. A natural tendency is to say, oh, that's great. <laughs> but we do have to file that and say, well, that is a change in behavior for him. I need to pay attention to that. Um, it's important because it may be that he's, he's just going to be having a good day, or it may be that something is up and it's an early warning sign. Um, so we're, we go through some different things that might be changes of behavior. We then look over on the other side of this model for what do I do? Well, my approach, and we name it that first level approach, is supportive. And what are we doing that's non judgmental? We're not judging the, the behavior we're seeing or that change in behavior that we're seeing. But we really need to basically check in with that student and um, see if they're okay. 
uh, find out if um, how they may be feeling. It's it's paying attention and, and listening empathically um, because they might have an issue that we can help them uh, address and we can avoid things moving to a second level of crisis, which we refer to as a defensive level of behavior. Again, not a Webster definition, but our definition of basically this is someone that's losing rationality. So um, they're not thinking clearly. They might be challenging. They might be questioning your authority. They might be yelling and screaming and shouting, um, but they are not, they're not presenting a risk, a physical risk. And while it is, it could be disruptive, um, we have to be directive and we need to decelerate instead of, you know, you think of a, a car and acceleration, we need to decelerate. And so we teach skills around how to decelerate to help that um, student to regain some of their rational thinking. And we do that by giving a directive and if they're not complying with the directive, um, setting limits and we go through that. The third level is the only level that we're addressing risk behavior. Again, as I mentioned in my introduction, sometimes people think CPI training means training and restraint use. And there is a level that we're addressing risk behavior. Someone that is presenting a risk, a danger to themselves or to someone else. And we do have to maintain responsibilities for not only their care and welfare, but for the safety and security of that student and for others. So we teach skills in disengagement and in holding safely to manage, to safely manage that risk behavior. So what else can be another level if there's four levels? What can be a level that, that doesn't fall into one of these categories? Well, it's one that we frequently forget about, and that is, it's not over till it's over. We all can, can just reflect on our own lives. You've gone through something that was really difficult or, or really exciting for one reason or another. And all of a sudden afterwards, you're like, did that just happen? What happened? You have questions about it, or you wonder about it, or you're embarrassed about it, or you're... Um, uh, you're tired, all sorts of things happen after we have elevated level of emotion. And there's a time after situation, before we get back to our normal level of behavior, that there's a decrease in physical and emotional energy. So we need to teach staff about reestablishing communication with that student, um, creating an opportunity to help that student get back to their normal level of behavior where their their questions might be dealt with they may not clearly remember everything that just happened i'm sure you've experienced that with your children uh after incidents after things they might be sleepy they might be crying they might be emotional they might be very apologetic and that's where they're at. They're in that period after having some problems that they need us to meet them where they're at. We need to be able to touch base with them and go through, you know, what happened and what um, what what you're feeling and that you still love and care about them. Well, the same kind of thing has to happen in, in a relationship and uh, between the, the educator and the student to reestablish that communication and have that uh, therapeutic rapport so we can get back to um, uh, that normal level of behavior. That is the crisis development model <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, you'll notice that arrow over the top uh, and we speak to that later in the program a little, in a little bit more detail, but we need to point out that integrated experience and that is the concept that behaviors and attitudes respond to behaviors and attitudes. So if I am um, a youth that might be in this anxiety level, I'm showing a change in behavior. If a staff member comes up and gives a directive, you know, Bonnie is, is pacing about and, and she's showing this change in behavior and I come up and say, Bonnie, stop pacing, sit down. Well, that's a directive. It's a directive with some poor use of language, 
but it's a directive. So if you think of behaviors responding to behaviors, where is she going to go? I was directive. I might have introduced this second level of behavior for Bonnie, and she may be saying, why are you picking on me? I'm just, I'm having a hard day. And she may be uh, become more disruptive because of my response. Um, so the same thing with, with any sort of physical intervention. We don't want to use physical intervention if someone is not in that third level of risk behavior, because if we do, and we put our hands on a um, student to, uh, yeah, maybe they're yelling and screaming and shouting. Maybe they're even intimidating us. We put our hands on them. We're bringing that behavior to that third level. We're introducing the physical intervention. That's where we might be part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Because that's where a child could say, get your hands off me. And they're starting to become physical. So we really stress that integrated experience and the significance of organizing our thinking and then figuring out where all these chaotic kinds of behaviors and experiences fit so we can start to learn the approaches that match those types of behaviors. If you look on the right side of this chart, these are some of the areas that we need to train staff in to build out their approaches, their supportive approaches, their directive approaches, um, their managing physical behavior, and their therapeutic rapport approaches. So uh, we teach communication skills, de-escalation, uh, limit setting. We explore the professionalism and the significance of precipitating factors. I mentioned the issue of fear and anxiety. We have to help staff understand the impact that, that our own fears and our own anxieties about what we're seeing have on our responses. And how do we get those in check so we are positive and productive in our responses? We also teach about decision making and, and assessing risk before we put our hands on someone to keep them safe. What are we assessing as risk? What are the legal frameworks? And where is my team in my responses for any physical um, risk behavior? I mentioned communication skills. We have a unit on nonverbal communication that addresses um, position, posture, proximity. A great percentage of the messages people receive are influenced by the nonverbal messages, the nonverbal communication, uh, more than the words we are saying. So in our lessons on nonverbal communication, uh, we there's a picture there that it's from the workbook and, and it's a supportive stance. I guess we didn't really have to label the staff. Hopefully the staff isn't the one pointing their finger. Uh, however, um, we talk about the supportive stance and again, it's a it's it's planting seeds for language about the program and and it isn't that I'm standing a, a particular way in every encounter with with someone I'm working with because that's not always uh, possible but the supportive stance addresses um, three objectives the first one is respect am I communicating respect am I being non-threatening with my body language. We can all get shoulder to shoulder, toe to toe. That communicates a kind of a threat, even if we're not meaning to be threatening. And are we keeping ourselves safe? So if I'm um, a leg length away from someone, I'm in a better situation, I'm in a better position, should they become physically aggressive, I can get myself out of the way safely. So we talk about nonverbal communication and also how we position our um, bodies through position, posture, and proximity. Uh, paraverbal communication is sort of that bridge between nonverbal and verbal communication. Uh, the, the way we say something versus exactly what we say. It involves the tone we use and the volume uh, of our messaging. Uh, we have a unit about empathic listening. 
in the significance of listening to the emotional messages and recognizing that we can learn some things to help that individual calm down if we are empathic in our listening. In our, in our de-escalation study, we explore that second level of crisis, which I told you about as the defensive level where someone is irrational. And we explore that through another model, which we call the verbal escalation continuum. Uh, the reason we have another model here is there's a lot happening when someone is losing rationality. It could be one or all of these things, but we do need to put that under a microscope a little bit because it's, it's what gets staff members off track of giving a simple directive to a student. Um, here's some examples. The student starts asking a lot of questions. A lot of times those questions could be challenging and they could be, you know, why are you always picking on me or who do you think you are or you're not my parent, you can't tell me to do this or you don't know what, me. And they're asked all these kinds of challenging questions and there's, a, there's always a risk of, of kind of getting in a tug of war with that student as we start to, to answer those questions. It, it pushes our buttons perhaps. Um, but there's also information seeking questions and they get um, mixed in with some emotion when someone is in that second level. So a student might want to comply. They're asking a lot of different questions. They might be challenging, questioning your authority. And all of a sudden they're asking a question that that is rational. All right, how long do I have to stay in there for? And it's coming out emotional, and it's coming out and they're yelling it. Um, and we forget to answer it because everything sort of sounds like a challenge. So we do practice in the training uh, through this verbal escalation continuum to, to help staff realize that those information seeking questions could easily get disguised and we forget and we don't answer them because there's so many other things that are coming out and the emotion is coming out. Um, another aspect of verbal escalation could be refusal, that non-compliance. And it isn't always just someone saying no, uh, sometimes it's they're not doing something or they're ignoring. And how do you set limits to uh, prompt a good decision about compliance? Um, talk about release and that emotion that comes out when someone is losing rationality and the importance of listening through that because a lot of times if someone, they might be yelling and, and emotional, but the hidden message is in there, the, a reason that they might be upset. Something that they're saying could be a string we pull on to help support them, to help, um, help them to make a good decision and comply. Um, intimidation is another area, uh, and that can be frightening for us as staff members and as parents if there's a threat or intimidation uh, where the individual is, is verbally threatening a staff member. Um, I have to be concerned about that. I have to pay attention to it. I have to take it seriously uh, and maybe have some other people around. But we need to train around that and, and how to do that because it is a time where um, there could be risk behavior, but we can also diffuse risk behavior. Uh, you notice tension reduction is there. We always want to help staff understand that we're looking for that drop in energy because it certainly can happen. And we do an activity in the program where, where you're actually playing the role of the student going through these different emotional releases and refusal. And uh, the staff that are going through the training experience that, yeah, it is tiring. We're only doing this for a few minutes, but there is a period of time that you have to take a breath. And so we do some practice around, at what point are you giving a directive? At what point are you, how are you paying attention to know that that student might be starting to uh, go into tension reduction? Because we don't want to miss those opportunities. And we certainly can when we get into um, some power struggles, which are very easy to get into in this state of irrational. Because um, someone could be, saying all sorts of things about you. 
and saying all sorts of things that they know or maybe they don't know that start to push your buttons. So how do you maintain your own rational um, self and your professionalism as this is going on? We teach about a uh, process for setting limits and there are a few different components to setting limits. Um, so we, we teach about the basics of setting limits is, is offering choices and consequences. Um, and this is, you've given a directive, you've said, Michael, get off the desk. You can't be standing on the desk, get off the desk. You know, when Michael is on the desk, I'm going to be simple in that. Michael, put your feet on the floor. <laughs> um, now I have to start to set limits. Michael, if you, if you come off the desk, You'll still be able to go to recess. If you don't come off the desk, there's a consequence, whatever that consequence may be for that particular um, student in those particular schools. So we're talking about what are, what are the reasonable and enforceable limits and how do we set them? We always want to offer that positive option first. When we offer limits to someone that is irrational, they're emotional, and the first thing they hear is they're going to lose a privilege or they're going to be in trouble. They shut down and it becomes more emotional and they don't hear that there's a way out, that there's an option for them to make a good choice. So we practice setting limits. We practice how to word limits, how to position a positive, and help a student make a good choice. The concept of the integrated experience comes up again with two other important concepts in the program. I mentioned that the integrated experience is that concept of behaviors responding to behaviors. As we look at the behavior levels of students, we can't look at those without considering what is behind that behavior. That behavior is a manifestation of something else that might be going on, a precipitating factor. Is that about the child uh, being stressed? Is it a, ch a learning challenge? A student on, on the autism spectrum, a student that may be on medications and having a reaction a student that's hungry. We look at what might be behind those behaviors as precipitating factors. How do we identify those? How do we learn about those? And how do we help a student to cope with those circumstances that might reoccur? On the other side of that integrated experience, we have to consider what impacts my attitude as a staff member. What impacts my approach? It could be I'm having a bad day. So we do need to address that. We can teach responses and skills for responses at each of the levels of crisis. And we could practice those here in training. But you have to always be aware uh, someone could push your buttons. Someone could, you know, call you a name and it's suddenly you are involved in a tug of war in some sort of a power struggle. So how do you maintain your professionalism? Um, an important part of the program to go through that, you know, addressing fear and anxiety. That when we're afraid, if something is making us afraid that we haven't thought about, we haven't understood, and we haven't even brought out of the darkness into the light to say, yes, it makes me afraid when a student does this, or it makes me afraid um, when I am having parent-teacher conferences and someone is, I, I'm in this uh, secluded area of the building. Um, people need to talk about these fears. If I talk about them and I start to look at what do I need to keep myself safe in those circumstances and I plan around it, in those moments that I'm afraid, I can use that fear, that, I'm, that adrenaline that comes with fear and everything that's happening um, to productive responses. If I don't pay attention to fear until it's happening, I'll find myself responding in unproductive ways. And we've all been there. 
you're afraid, fear kicks in and you freeze. You suddenly can't do anything. Well, freezing takes on many forms. If you're a teacher in school and you have some fear that's brewing inside of you, freezing might be ignoring something. Freezing might be walking away. You can have an unproductive response. You can have an inappropriate response. We've all done that as well. You're afraid. Something just takes you by surprise and makes you afraid. And there's something that you say or do that you probably look back at and say, that was not appropriate. There can also be overreaction. On one hand, you have freezing. There could be an overreaction when we're afraid. We respond to behavior uh, of, a, of a child who is threatening us. And th that is making us afraid. And we move to an overreaction. We start to um, use a physical intervention when perhaps we don't need to use a physical intervention because there isn't a safety risk. So fear and anxiety is an important part uh, of teaching and the program uh, to help staff manage their own attitudes and approaches. The decision-making assessment and staff making sure that they're aware of what their options are um, in making decisions for intervention uh, help that integrated experience. Part of that risk assessment and that decision-making uh, unit addresses any sort of legal and professional standards and frameworks. Uh, in Wisconsin, uh, the, the report that was put out by, um, co-authored with uh, Wisconsin Facets and Disability Rights, uh, that's an important element that teachers need to know about and consider just as the, the, the legal framework of Wisconsin 125. Uh, we actually put out, and, and that's one of your, your handouts if you'd like to see it. We developed a document that shows how the elements of the nonviolent crisis intervention program align with that framework. Um, so that's an important part when we look at risk assessment and decision making. We have a model that we use to help staff consider that every risk is not a high risk. Um, we look at a matrix and consider um, kind of a low, medium, and high risk. And we do that by considering the severity of an outcome and the likelihood that this is actually going to result in a risk behavior. Uh, it's, it's a complex model, but it does help staff to organize their thinking about all of the various risk behaviors. And in doing that, it helps us to move into our units about physical intervention. As we look at physical intervention, we consider a framework, uh, the SEAT framework. Uh, so anything that you're responding with, is it safe? Is it effective? Is it acceptable? And is it transferable to a different situation? So we teach physical interventions based on principles versus an exact technique that you're always looking at this framework and you're always looking at something we refer to, I don't have a slide on, it's called the opt-out sequence. And the opt-out sequence is a way for staff to continually consider the people and the behavior and the environment. Why am I involved with holding this individual, this student? What is happening with that student? Are they calming down? Can I reduce the level of restriction? And is it time for us to let go? I have to always be thinking of that because someone may calm down during that was that was physically aggressive and presenting a very significant risk uh, a minute ago. So we looked we look at the review framework as well as the opt out sequence. Uh, some of you are familiar with physical interventions and managing risks. Um, we tend to not put pictures out of the uh, physical interventions, but I did want to share these with you, and I just want to ask you, this isn't something to, to pass on because that actually increases risks. When people look at a picture of something, uh, these are not, um, these are, these are, all these circumstances are, are not the same. We teach to principles, and when people look at a picture and they feel, without any training, I can do this, 
um, that actually increases the risk. So I just ask you to uh, not pass these around because I'd be concerned that um, people just kind of look at this going, I can do that. Um, teaching this particular um, hold, a uh, children's control position, uh, addresses sort of this is where I have someone that is a low level of risk. I might just be trying to manage those little arms um, that are going after someone. Now, of course, this is a classroom picture. We're teaching a classroom model. We practice so the staff understand you don't need to move in with a full level of restriction in every circumstance. So here's just an example for you on um, kind of three different levels. How, how much do I have to manage that student? Um, we teach, uh, again, based on principles, I'm controlling the arms as weapons. If I position myself with something on the outside and something on the inside, I can manage um, those, if, that, if those arms are going to flail or hurt someone, I can manage those without being extremely restrictive. And then we um, kind of elevate, if the risk elevates, how do I control that? How do I position my body so if that, uh, student is flailing about, you think that doesn't look like you're uh, managing them, but you come into the training and you see, um, I could position my body on, on either side of this student in that picture, and any type of movement could be managed, and it doesn't have to, uh, there's, there's no element of, of pain compliance, there's no element of strength on strength. What we're really trying to do is manage the aggressive range of motion until that student calms down and can manage their own um, behavior. Um, anything we teach in the way of physical intervention has been independently risk assessed, and uh, we are always recognizing variations of the risk and the, and the need of the range of options to keep someone safe and recognize when they're calming down. Uh, there's another example, you know, what am I doing with that child who's seated? So we're able to kind of tr transfer, like I showed you in that safe, effective, acceptable, transferable. I, I can transfer those same principles in a seated situation. I transfer those same principles to someone that's larger in a standing situation. Um, so it's not always easy to teach about physical interventions, but it is a component of our program because we do want to help people manage that third level of behavior, which is risk behavior. Again, someone is a danger. They are presenting a danger where someone can be hurt or they're hurting themselves. Um, it's hard to show just a few pictures, but I wanted to give you a sense of uh, we aren't putting someone um, in a dangerous situation to manage their danger. <laughs> We're trying to keep them safe and keep others safe. Again, that is our uh, philosophy. Are we providing for the best possible care and welfare while maintaining safety and security? The last level of behavior, we also go through a model called the coping model. We want to address that tension reduction stage, that stage where someone is not yet back to a safe um, not, that, not yet back to their um, normal level of behavior. And the coping model is just a way for us to give reminders. Um, so go through, um, is everybody back in control, emotionally and physically? Is that student back in control? And if not, um, we need to orient them back to the basic facts. We need to let them know, listen, you had a rough time there and you went and you were trying to um, grab Bonnie's hair. Um, that's why we were holding on to you. You, know, you need to, to, to address that because they may not remember, they may not really have that in their minds is what happened. Um, we're, doing this, we're doing this to some extent with the student in some ways and then differently with our, our teams. Um, you know, uh, Billy, you, uh, you did that last Monday. You did that two Mondays ago, and and I'm wondering what, how you're feeling at the start of the school week. Is there something there that we could be doing differently? So we're looking for patterns and triggers. Is it an area of the building? Is it a time of day? Um, investigating alternatives to that behavior. What else can you do when you're feeling hungry? What else can you do on Monday mornings when 
um, you're tired or when whatever it is that we identified is happening. Um, start to negotiate. What are some other things that we can do to help you? Can you, you know, come to me in this way? Can you, you know, uh, give me this, you know, red card on the table and then I know you need to take a little bit of a time out somewhere else to calm yourself down. Um, but we always need to close it up. We always need to give control back to that individual, provide them the support and the encouragement um, to make better choices and to move forward. So we do go through, um, that's really a coping model in a nutshell. That's, a, that's, a, that's the, um, an, an important uh, level of the program, as important as any other level to learn about. Um, but I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of it, but there are um, a lot of components to that, and I'm sure some of that resonated with you as parents, you know, kind of coming back around to um, let's talk about what happened a little bit. Um, that's how we end the program. There are 10 units of nonviolent crisis intervention, and when someone completes those 10 units, there's a, a post-test. I mentioned those certified instructors. Um, there are schools that CPI staff, our global professional instructors, go in and teach. But for the most part, in schools, we have trained individuals as certified instructors. I mentioned the instructor certification program. I'm actually in Madison right now, and there's a there's an instructor certification program happening that I, I was sitting in on. Um, it's a four-day program, and those individuals that will be instructors participate in the full uh, 10 units, the full 14-hour program for the first two days. And then for an additional two days, they go back through every unit of the program and um, they do teach backs. Um, our, inst our staff instructors, our global professional instructors are, are helping them to customize the program given the um, circumstances that they are, will be training in. And they have testing, um, a lot more practice on all of the interventions and uh, the physical interventions. They have to kind of, how are you going to teach this to others and how do you monitor the safety of those? We go through the standards and the training quality standards, the expectations, um, the validation and credentialing. One aspect of our credentialing you hear referred to as a blue card, and there's a picture of it. If you want to know if, if um, someone is trained in nonviolent crisis intervention, uh, they'll have a blue card. If they participated in a program taught by a certified instructor, that certified instructor will give them a blue card. And on that blue card, they'll say they completed this many hours of training, the date of that training, and it will have the instructor's name on it. So that's always a helpful way of knowing if, in fact, they went through this particular program or maybe someone was just saying CPI because someone taught them how to use a physical intervention and they decided to call that CPI. Uh, so we do have that link back to authorized training through the CPI blue card. Bonnie, can we stop for a minute? I wanted to ask you if there's any questions. Um, I have no questions at this time. I know I'm talking really fast, um, but I did want to get through and help you to at least have a high-level understanding of the components of nonviolent crisis intervention that you understand that CPI as the Crisis Prevention Institute teaches nonviolent crisis intervention. It is not just a program for teaching a restraint that we actually uh, when we refer to risk behavior, we talk about disengaging. Um, so the first thing we teach staff is if someone is grabbing you, how do you get away safely without hurting them? And if you're away from them, what, are, what is the assessment that you are doing to determine if you need to hold on to them? And if you do determine be, for their safety or the safety of others to hold on to them, the holding skills that um, we teach, we actually refer to them as holding skills, and because we want to communicate, you're holding on to them to manage that aggression, not to restrict something or to harm them, but to manage until they man are managing themselves. So it's really a philosophical approach 
that is different than we're teaching a restraint program. So I wanted to make sure you understood that. Um, make sure you you were very clear that we do not um, <laughs> have a program that is just teaching restraints. If anyone is teaching our program, uh, there are requirements. They the certified instructor does not have to teach the entire 14-hour program, but there are requirements for what must be included in a program that they call nonviolent crisis intervention and that they give someone a blue card for. And it has to include those preventative techniques that a very important philosophy, the important crisis development model, practice and rehearsal of any of the skills that you want staff to use in verbal de-escalation and in any physical interventions that they're authorized to use. Um, all of those things are part of the program. You can't just teach physical interventions and call it nonviolent crisis intervention. Um, we also advocate for a training process. So we do not believe that training is a one-time deal. Um, our certified instructors have to come back for renewal. Uh, we recommend that staff at the schools come back for renewal. That is up to the school. That is in the school policy. There are some schools that require their um, staff who are uh, responders. They do respond, they do respond to behaviors, they have um, training and authorization to use a physical intervention to manage risk behavior. Um, some schools have those individuals uh, go through training or refresher training every six months and are doing some sort of a practice and a review and a rehearsal of different skills, verbal de-escalation skills, the physical skills um, on a monthly basis. There's and maybe some other staff in the school that don't have regular contact with students who are exhibiting behaviors, um, they may go through on an annual basis. So it's always a question you can, you can ask. And I think that's kind of what I want to leave us with is an understanding that um, we all can work together to improve the future, to improve what is happening in schools, to safely manage situations and to keep safe and secure environments while maintaining care and welfare. Um, but we all need to be on the same page. Last year, uh, we were fortunate to have uh, Wisconsin Facets, Disability Rights Wisconsin, and some parents come out to CPI's headquarters in Milwaukee. And we did a, um, um, a one-day kind of training. And some of it was like I just did for you, but some of that was the actual training and practice. Um, and we learned from those parents and, and the advocacy groups perceptions of what CPI training really meant. And that really led us to understand to a greater degree that we need to um, have more of you out there <laughs> uh, understanding what the what our program is. So um, you can you can ask questions about that. And a school that is working with children that might exhibit challenging behaviors, that may exhibit um, risk behaviors, uh, does need to have training. Now, whether it's CPI training or another training program, um, you, we want you to be empowered to ask questions about that. Uh, and I guess some of those questions may be as simple as, um, what training does your staff have to manage challenging behaviors? Uh, what training does your staff have to work with uh, my child who is on the autism spectrum? Um, is Are there trauma-informed practices that staff are trained in? Do staff have training in positive behavior interventions? And then ask about what that training is. Whether it's our training or another training, I do know um, it's always something that, that gets cut and it's concerning to me and it should be concerning to you. Um, when a school district says, yes, we used to have our staff go through the two-day nonviolent crisis intervention program, but you know, it's expensive for substitute teachers. And so now we're, you know, we just want to train them in one day. And I think, okay, 
we wouldn't recommend you teach any physical interventions if you are you know, modifying the program and teaching an abridged version of that. Um, you need to let staff have the opportunity to discuss and to practice if they're teaching these skills. Um, so we always, we always encourage you to ask questions and to advocate for that time that staff would come together for training. If you have any other um, questions about that or we can help you in any way um, in, in consider answering questions about our program or considering what kinds of um, discussions might be needed at, at schools that your children are in, please. Oh, it went away. Did I go away? Yeah, I think you just have to go back to the last slide there. <laughs> All right. I don't know where it there went. you go. There um, you go. There's my email address. It went away again. I didn't touch anything. Maybe you can just read it to them so that they know. All right. My email address is jschubert, J-S-C-H-U-B-E-R-T, at crisisprevention.com. My first initial and last name at crisisprevention.com. Sorry, that is so long. Um, but we're available and we'd be happy to, to have further conversation. If there's any questions now, I, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, at this time, Judith, we don't have any questions, but I believe that individuals now that have your email address can probably address any other further questions to you um, to that address in the future. Um, so yes. seeing no other questions, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Judith for a very informative um, presentation today. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us um, and to let everybody know that Wisconsin Facets has over 100 scheduled trainings and webinars for 2017. And please check our website calendar and register for any upcoming trainings that you'd be interested in. Also, please watch for the short evaluation coming your way after today's webinar. And also be reminded that a copy of today's webinar will be emailed to you after today's webinar in approximately two hours. Again, thank you, Judith, for a fine presentation today. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Judith, thanks again. And thank talk you. to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye now. Thank you.